Hi everyone, welcome back to this short tutorial from Pathology Made Simple at ilopathology.com and supported by Wisdolia, which is an amazing AI based study tool. At the end of this session, I will be posting the link for practice sessions via Wisdolia. So, in continuation with the autoimmune diseases series, we were learning about systemic lupus erythematosus, right? So, in the last session, we talked about autoantibodies, and in this session, let's understand in detail about the pathogenesis of systemic lupus erythematosus and also the mechanisms of tissue injury in systemic lupus erythematosus. A very quick recap as to what we had learnt in the last session is that, you know, we saw that there were many autoantibodies in systemic lupus erythematosus. The classes include plasma proteins, protein phospholipid complexes, cell surface antigens, cytoplasmic components and nuclear components and we also learned that it is the anti-nuclear antibodies which is very important in the pathogenesis of systemic lupus erythematosus particularly antibodies to double stranded DNA and anti-Smith antigen. These are the two important antigens for which autoantibodies develop and they are more specific for systemic lupus erythematosus. Now let's get back to understanding the concepts behind pathogenesis of systemic lupus erythematosus. While I was talking about the general pathogenesis of autoimmune diseases, I had mentioned that it is the imbalance between the lymphocyte activation and the mechanisms of tolerance which makes the disease autoimmune, which means there has to be failure in the mechanisms of tolerance for the disease to be referred to as autoimmunity, right? So, this is what happens in systemic lupus erythematosus as well. So, we need to understand as to why this tolerance fails. We will try to understand this by looking at various genetic factors, immunologic factors and environmental triggers which results in systemic lupus erythematosus. So, firstly, genetic factors. So, systemic lupus erythematosus or SLA is a complex polygenic disorder, multigenic disorder. So, when I say that this is a complex polygenic disorder or multigenic disorder, we need to know what are the proof that genetics contribute to SLE. The first evidence which we can think of is the family members of patients will have an increased risk of developing SLE. Second, 20% of clinically unaffected first degree relatives you know, of SLE patients, they also have autoantibodies. And the most important one is the higher rate of concordance, more than 20% in monozygotic twins as compared to that of dizygotic twins, which is around 1 to 3 percent. So, the, all these, you know, evidences say that genetics do contribute to SLE. So, the most common genetic predisposition for SLE is located at the major histocompatibility locus. For example, HLA-DQ. If there is a defect or a polymorphism or a mutation in this particular gene, which is involved in the production of anti-double-stranded DNA, anti-Smith antigen as well as anti-phospholipid antibodies. The other genes which are associated include HLA, DRB1, DR2 and DR3. One more important thing you need to remember is that if there are mutations which cause deficiencies of early component, early complement components such as C2, C4 and C1Q, this indicates that the individual has a very high risk of development of systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, once you have these genetic defects, then comes the immunologic factors where there is persistence and uncontrolled activation of these self-reactive lymphocytes. And because of those genetic defects, there is failure of self-tolerance in B cells as well as defective peripheral tolerance mechanisms. And more than that, CD4 positive helper T cells get activated which helps the B cells to produce lots and lots of high affinity pathogenic autoantibodies. Remember, type 1 interferon plays a major role in lymphocyte activation in SLE. You know, these interferons, they are produced when the nucleic acid binds to all like receptors. So, where do this nucleic acid come from? Nucleic acid comes from whenever there, are, whenever there is a damage to a cell leading on to apoptosis or any form of death of the cell, death of the cell, releasing the nuclear content outside. So, when such nucleic acid bind to all like receptors, they activate the dendritic cells as well as B cells and also promote 
the T helper 1 cell responses, which finally leads to stimulation of B cells to produce pathogenic autoantibodies, which results in inflammation and various other manifestations. So, I will try to explain this with illustration a bit later. As of now, remember that type 1 interferons plays a major role in lymphocyte activation in SLE. The last one is the environmental triggers, which basically is the one which exacerbates the disease, particularly the exposure to ultraviolet rays, ultra ultraviolet light. Once the tissue is exposed to ultraviolet light, in a person who is genetically susceptible, the cells are damaged and undergo apoptosis. It also results in alteration in the DNA, which is recognized by the toll-like receptors and the recognition by toll-like receptors in various cells, particularly B cells and dendritic cells is enhanced and finally leading on to inflammation by the mechanisms we just understood. Ultraviolet light also stimulates keratinocytes which leads to production of interleukin-1 which results in inflammation. There are various drugs which are also implicated in the development of SLE, particularly hydralazine, procainamide and the penicillamine. It's very important to know the role of sex hormones in SLE because SLE is more common in women which is exacerbated during normal menses and pregnancy. Okay, Though the mechanism is not known, it is very important to note that estrogen does play a major role in the development of SLE. Cigarette smoking again has increased risk of development of SLE. Infections, particularly Epstein-Barr virus infection, can trigger systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, let's put all these together and try to understand the mechanism of development of systemic lupus erythematosus. Now, you have an individual with increased susceptibility to the development of SLE due to various mutations or polymorphisms which leads to the susceptibility gene leading on to abnormal immune response or failure of tolerance mechanisms. And because of these factors, there is increased production of self-reactive lymphocytes which leads to production of more and more autoantigens particularly for the nuclei. Now, let us see how these nuclei are exposed. That's by environmental triggers as we saw earlier like ultraviolet light and infections which can you know, lead to apoptosis of the cells. And we know during the process of apoptosis, lots and lots of apoptotic bodies are formed and these bodies are devoured or phagocytosed by the surrounding macrophages, right? So, if there is a defective clearance mechanism of these apoptotic bodies, what will happen? The apoptotic body disintegrate releasing nuclear antigens. So, more and more nuclear antigens are exposed for which there is production of autoantibodies, right? And now you have antibodies, you have nuclear antigen and then there is formation of immune complexes. So, now these immune complexes, they are recognized by B cell as well as dendritic cells. They have receptor, okay? The FC receptor recognizes these immunoglobulin molecule, right? So, there is binding of the immune complexes on to the B cell as well as dendritic cell. It not just binds, it internalizes, you know, there is endocytosis and then the immune complexes gets into these cells within the endosome. Now, the most important step happens, that is engagement of the toll-like receptors by these nuclear antigens is what we studied earlier, right? So, these toll-like receptors are seen on the cell membrane, within the cytoplasm as well as on the endosomal membranes. So, the toll-like receptors engage these antigens, nuclear antigens, which is bound to the autoantibody. Now, once that happens, there is activation of nuclear kappa factor B and finally leads on to production of type 1 interferon. Now, this type 1 interferon, it stimulates these B cells again, okay? Get activated, get converted to plasma cells and produce more and more antibodies and that's the reason why there is persistent high-level anti-nuclear immunoglobulin G antibody production. Now, you have more antibodies, that means there will be more and more immune complexes being depo deposited and if you have more and more immune complexes, that results in more injury. Now, the next question is, now that you have immune complexes, what is the mechanism of injury in the tissues?
So, as I told you in my earlier session, the most common mechanism of tissue injury is type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, right? So, we know that the immune complexes are formed and these immune complexes are deposited in various tissues as well as blood vessels. So, once there is deposition of immune complexes in various tissues, lots and lots of cells are activated leading on to production of more cytokines and then leading on to inflammation and injury. As I told you, the most common antibodies are anti-nuclear antibodies, right? So, these DNA, anti-DNA complexes can be detected in the glomeruli as well as various small blood vessels. But first thing you need to remember is that the anti-nuclear antibodies cannot penetrate the intact cells, right? So, whenever there is inflammation or injury, the nuclei are exposed. If the nuclei are not exposed, anti-nuclear antibodies cannot bind. And once the nuclei are exposed, these autoantibodies bind. And this binding leads to losing of chromatin of these nuclei. And once there is loosening of chromatin, which finally becomes homogeneous, the nucleus becomes homogeneous and this is referred to as lupus erythematosus bodies or LE bodies or hematoxylin bodies. This mechanism is very well utilized in the diagnosis of uh, you know, SLE in the earlier years where a sample of blood was taken which was agitated because agitation leads to break of these nucleated cells, particularly the leukocytes and the nuclei are exposed, right? Now, if this patient has autoantibodies, they bind to the nuclei leading on to LA bodies or hematoxylin bodies as we studied. These LA bodies, they are phagocytosed by the adjacent intact neutrophil or macrophage and that cell is referred to as LA cell or lupus erythematosus cell. Okay, so this was the concept behind demonstration of LA cell in patients suffering from SLE, right? This is an in vitro test where the nuclei are exposed by agitation. If the patient has autoantibodies, they bind to the exposed nuclei, forming hematoxylin bodies, which is a homogeneous eosinophilic body, which is phagocytosed by intact neutrophil, and that cell with LA body is known as LE cell, right? Though the most common mechanism of tissue injury is type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, the second most common can be type 2 hypersensitivity as well where there is antibody mediated tissue injury. It is not by the formation of immune complexes, it is direct injury by antibodies, okay? So, these autoantibodies which may be specific for the red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets which we saw earlier in the last session, right? And these you know, autoantibodies opsonize these cells which further promote their phagocytosis and destruction leading on to various cytopenias. And the most common cytopenia is immune thrombocytopenic purpura, which occurs in up to 10% of patients in SLE. So, remember, type 3 hypersensitivity is the most common mechanism of tissue injury in SLE, followed by type 2 hypersensitivity, particularly when we are looking at cytopenias. So, that is all for today's session. In my next session, we will try to understand the microscopic features of various organs involved in SLE. As I had mentioned in the beginning, I would suggest you to click on the practice session below in the pinned comment. And this is via Visdolia, which is an AI based study tool where you can take up multiple choice questions, short answers, as well as clinical case scenarios. And the best part of this study tool is that you will get an instant feedback if you go wrong while answering these questions. It's really fun to learn. Just try to attempt answering these questions so that you'll know how you have learned the concepts of pathogenesis of SLE. Thank you for watching. If you have liked this video, do comment. Don't forget to subscribe and please do share with your friends. Bye-bye.